Hello and welcome back. You're watching Perry This. Today we are taking a look at the life and times of a very important historical figure in 1400s Bohemia that even after death shaped the society that he was a member of for years to come. I'm of course talking about the Czech religious reformer John Hus, or as he would have been known to it in his homeland of Bohemia, Jan Hus. Unlike many of the people I have covered in my history video series for the game Kingdom Come Deliverance, Jan Hus never actually appears, but much of the tension in the storyline is at least in some small way connected to him. So let's just dive on in and learn what we can in this distilled biography of Jan Hus. As far as early life is concerned, Jan Hus has not much to speak of. Himself being a lowborn peasant born in rural Bohemia, it is likely that if he had not taken to the cloth, he would have been born, lived, and died, and nobody would have ever learned his name. And by extension, tens of thousands of people wouldn't have had their lives cut short in the Hussite Wars, and a couple of crusades would have likely been avoided. But with all that in mind, young Jan Hus was born in Husinek, a small community in the Kingdom of Bohemia in 1369. It is from this community that his last name is derived. At a young age, probably in his preteens, he traveled to Prague and earned a living by singing and serving in churches in and around Prague. It was at this time that he began his education at the University of Prague. As far as his education goes, he earned his bachelor's degree in the arts in 1393 at the age of 24. The subjects of study in this degree would have been history, theology, philosophy, as well as the seven liberal arts, grammar, dialectic, which means logic, uh, rhetoric, arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, and music. He continued his education at the University of Prague for three more years before earning his master's degree in 1396. He spent the next four years training at the seminary before being ordained as a priest in 1400. At this time, he became a rector at the university until 1403. For reference, a rector is a cleric set to administrative tasks and would have been relatively common posting for young priests fresh out of the seminary, especially well-educated ones like Hus. Somewhere between 1402 and 1403, Jan Hus was appointed as the parish priest for the newly built Bethlehem Chapel in the town of Old Prague. Due to his intelligence, charisma, and talent at both speaking and singing, Hus quickly became a popular preacher and built a strong following. Hus was also known to be a strong advocate of his countrymen, the Czechs, and by extension, the Realists, which would later become to be known as the Czech People's Party, even later becoming known as the Czech Progressive Party or the Czech Realist Party. Of course, the political aspects of this party or their political aspirations would not be attached to them until 1900, so the affiliation is an afternote and should not be contributed to the beliefs or teachings of Jan Hus, many of which are in stark contrasts to his beliefs and teachings. In any case, Jan Hus was heavily influenced by the writings of another popular theologian, John Wycliffe, an English scholastic philosopher, theologian, biblical translator, reformer, English priest, and a seminary professor at the University of Oxford. This is where Jan Hus's first problems with the church started. Since the works of John Wycliffe were proscribed by the church in 1403, this was only bound to get Jan Hus in trouble. Prescription is, in current usage, a decree of condemnation to death or banishment, and can be used in a political context to refer to state-approved murder or banishment. The term originated in ancient Rome, where it where it included public identification and official condemnation of declared enemies of the state. So in essence, this meant that the church had banned all teachings, texts, and translations of John Wycliffe to be preached or taught within the Catholic Church. Despite this, Jan Hus translated Wycliffe's Triologus into Czech and distributed heavily in Prague and the surrounding areas. So before moving on, we should talk about the Triologus and why this is such a big deal. Wycliffe's Trilogus discusses divine power and knowledge, creation, virtues, and vices, the incarnation, redemption, and the sacraments. It consists of a three-way conversation, which Wycliffe wrote to familiarize priests and layfolk with the complex issues underlying Christian doctrine, and begins with formal philosophical theology, which moves into moral theology, concluding with a searing critique of 14th century ecclesiastical status quo. John Wycliffe is known for translating the Vulgate Bible into English and for arguing for the royal divestment of the church, the reduction of papal power and the elimination of the friars, and against the doctrine of transubstantiation. So without going too deeply into Catholic theology and doctrine, Wycliffe's works were not only an attack on society, but the church's doctrines and dogmas themselves. So by translating and distributing these works, that had already been officially banned by the church, Jan Hus doubled down on what Wycliffe had said and done. 
1411, the newly elected King Sigismund of Germany and Hungary decided to appoint himself Restorer of the Church and ordered the Council of Constance to be convened. He invited Hus to attend and defend his views and his actions, assuring him safe passage for the return journey. Hus eventually agreed to attend but did not receive the conduct he had been promised. Upon his ar arrival, by consent of Sigismund, Hus was arrested and confined. As a result of frantic intervention by Bohemian nobles supportive of Hus, he was granted three public hearings to defend his views, leading to an acquittal of some of the charges. However, some charges of heretical views remained, and Hus was warned that unless he recanted these views, he would face execution. He refused. So it should come as no surprise that on June 5th, 1415, the Pope formed a committee of three high-ranking bishops to perform a preliminary investigation against Jan Hus. It was on June 5th, 1415 that Jan Hus was transferred to the nearby Franciscan Monastery, where he would spend the last few weeks of his life. In his trial, he acknowledged the writings on the church against Palech and Stanislaus of his name as his own, and declared himself willing to recant if errors should be proven to him. Basically, he just kept telling the people trying him that if they could point out where in scripture it says that he was wrong, he would recant. Basically, admitting everything he said was wrong and making up for it through a penance of some sort. Hus also admitted to his veneration of the condemned heretic John Wycliffe and said that he could only wish his soul might sometime attain unto that place where Wycliffe's was. Now for those of you who do not know, veneration is a sacred term used by the Catholic Church to honor people of great holiness, generally reserved for saints. Since Wycliffe had been publicly pronounced a heretic by the Church, this was taken as proof of heresy on at least one count and would prove to be the second nail in Jan Hus's coffin. Jan Hus was condemned on July 6, 1415 in the presence of the Solemn Assembly of the Council of Constance in the Cathedral. After the High Mass and Liturgy, Jan Hus was brought into the Church before the Council. At this time, the Bishop of Lodi delivered a long-winded oration on his duty to seek out and eradicate heresy. This was followed by the reading of several of both Hus's and Wycliffe's thesis being read aloud to the council, followed by a full report of Hus's trial. An Italian prelate pronounced the sentence of condemnation upon Hus and his writings. Again, Hus protested loudly, saying that even at this hour he did not wish anything but to be convinced from Holy Scripture. He fell upon his knees and asked God to forgive all his enemies. Then followed his degradation. He was enrobed in priestly vestments and asked again to recant. Again he refused. With curses, his ornaments were taken from him. His priestly tonsure, otherwise known as that goofy hair ring that monks and priests at the time were known for, was destroyed, and the sentence was pronounced that the church had deprived him of all rights and delivered him to the secular powers. Then a high paper hat was put upon his head, with the inscription Heresiarcha, in other words, heretic. Thus, Hus was led away to the stake under a strong guard of armed men. The executioners undressed Hus and tied his hands behind his back with ropes, and his neck with a chain to the stake around which wood and straw had been piled up to, so that it covered him to the neck. The executioners kindled the fire around Jan Hus with pages torn from many of Wycliffe's works, showing that the poetic irony was lost on nobody that day. After his burning, the ashes from the pyre containing Jan Hus's remains were taken and cast into the nearby Rhine River, as was common practice in the execution of heretics. A fun little interesting note, despite having died nearly 30 years before the Council of Constance, after Jan Hus's sentence, John Wycliffe's remains were exhumed, burnt, and also thrown into a river as he had also been formally declared a heretic. So that's fun. Also, as a fun side note, I will include in the description either a list of or a link to the 30 condemned articles of heresy that led to Jan Hus being burnt at the stake. Give them a read, as I'm sure it will make it pretty clear why what he was saying ended up getting him executed. In any case, the death of Jan Hus was only the beginning of a large chain of events that in one way or another led to a ton of people being killed, mostly through religious wars and conflicts. Directly, Jan Hus's burning led to the Hussite Wars, also called the Bohemian Wars or the Hussite Revolution, were a series of wars fought between the Christian Hussites and the combined Christian Catholic forces of Sigismund, Holy Roman Emperor, the Papacy, and various European monarchs loyal to the Catholic Church, as well as among various Hussite factions themselves. After initial clashes, the Ultraquists changed sides in 1423 to fight alongside Roman Catholics and opposed the Taborites and other Hussite spin-offs. These wars lasted from 1419 to approximately 1434. 
Although exact numbers are impossible to come by, I found estimates ranging from 10 to 30% of Bohemia's population dying between both sides of the Husai Wars before the conflict finally ended. And then, if we are going to take this all a step further, many years later a young Martin Luther would come across many of the preachings of Jan Hus and become inspired by them, which would play a large part in the Protestant Reformation, which would likewise lead to a great many changes and conflicts all across Europe. So, as I have said a few times in this video, the burning of Jan Hus was an extremely influential and far-reaching occurrence that would have drastic repercussions on the geopolitical landscape of Europe for hundreds of years afterwards. So that is basically all there is to know about Jan Hus. Of course, to keep this video down to a reasonable length, I cut a lot of small details out and left out several things that I had originally planned to include, but I believe this should leave the viewer with a pretty good foundation of knowledge for who this man was, why he was executed, and what happened afterwards at least from a very high level view. So I hope you enjoyed this video and I hope you found it informational. But in any case, thanks for watching and have a nice day. I'll see you next time.